So welcome to, the, to today's seminar by Andres Milga. We have a Gothic theme today. So it's about ghosts, but uh, Andre will convince us they are not all that bad. And there are also some friendly ghosts around. So go okay. ahead, Andre. Okay, thank you, Andreas. So uh, look, I made a talk on the subject in this seminar about a year ago. Uh, but then I am not doing only ghosts, I'm doing also other things. But after uh, this talk, I started to think again uh, about uh, this issue. And uh, there are some new results uh, which uh, I found out. Uh, first, well, uh, there was a paper uh, by myself about a year ago, and then right now, we are working together with uh, Thibaut Damour. The paper is almost ready, but not yet published. And uh, so uh, today uh, I will tell you mostly about these new results. Uh, well, I said mostly about new results, but uh, I have uh, not uh, half an hour, and not 20 minutes, as people usually have at uh, the conferences, but just an hour. And so uh, I am able to talk uh, in more details. And so probably the first half of my talk will be the reminder of what I said the last time. And please stop me if uh, you uh, just all, all, already know that and don't want uh, to that I repeat it. Then I just directly go to new stuff. Okay, uh, so uh, mm, what is my motivation? Uh, that's some speculative part of the talk. Uh, I don't insist uh, that it's my dreams are correct, but then there will be some positive parts, some uh, explicit scientific results, but I will start with the motivation. So I have a dream. Well, well, you see, that's uh, uh, something that everybody knows, uh, the citation of, uh, famous citation of Newton. Uh, but I must say that uh, today, of course, we know much more than Newton. We understand uh, the physics of the world around us, but we don't uh, much uh, well uh, went to the depth of the matter. Uh, this ocean of unknown for Newton, but now we know that, is now charted up to the energy about uh, 1,000 GV. But uh, there is still a long way to go to Planck scale, 10 to the, the uh, 19 GV. And we need to go there to understand what is quantum gravity, what is gravity, and what is quantum gravity especially. And so uh, you see that we charted now about 10 to the minus 16th part of the ocean. And we don't know uh, what is the fundamental theory of everything. So there are just some conjectures and hypotheses about it. Now the prevailing uh, uh, paradigm right now is uh, that uh, the fundamental theory of everything is some variant of theory of strings. strings. But uh, I try to explore another uh, option where it's not strings, but just field theory. But what kind of field theory? So uh, the uh, principal problem in, uh, in constructing the mental theory of everything, and especially quantum gravity, is not even known the renormalizability of Einstein gravity. That's bad, but not the worst thing. And the worst is non-causality, because uh, when time is intertwined with uh, spatial coordinates, uh, so we cannot, uh, for strong gravitational fields, pose Cauchy problem, uh, development in time. There are some girded solutions with closed time loop and you go uh, forth and uh, find yourself back in time and can kill your grandfather, things like that. So, well, it's not acceptable. Uh, 
So uh, speaking of strings, uh, strings are formulated uh, mostly in the flat in space time, 10 dimension with its sweet little strings. So uh, seems that this problem, well, one can hope to solve it. But uh, we don't have now really fundamental string theory because you know there is first quantization uh, in usual quantum mechanics, that second quantization, there is second quantization, that's field theory, and to construct uh, string theory uh, from the first principle, you need something like third quantization, where the uh, uh, instead of uh, mm, fields the functions of uh, the coordinates, you should uh, be able to work with functionals, which depend on the form uh, of the string. And it's not yet now well worked out. We, uh, the string theory uh, of today is, uh, well, not really fundamental uh, theory, but uh, the uh, lowest stories of the building are kind of hit of miss in miss and uh, we can only uh, well regard it starting from uh, i don't know uh, third, third floor fourth floor something like that where it's, it's very beautiful but um, the foundation of the building are uh, not ac accessible right now and also there are no phenomenological successes so uh, the alternative viewpoint is uh, that uh, the fundamental theory of everything is uh, field theory, but related in some high dimensional space time, flat high dimensional space time. And then our universe is kind of brain, so like a soul film in this high dimensional space. That's the dream. Now, uh, 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 well, if it's uh, a soap, then it can be curved. And so uh, you are obtaining natural, uh, well, gravity, the uh, theory of a curved uh, space. So uh, uh, for the soap film, the Hamiltonian is just the surface tension times the area. And you see that the area is the integral of the square root of determinant of the matrix. So it looks like geometrical theory. It looks a little bit like gravity. It's like cosmological term in gravity. But uh, we have a problem. So we have to work in higher dimensions, right? Try something uh, the same as uh, we are used to in four dimensions. For example, try Young Mills in uh, some higher dimension like six dimension. So you see that the coupling constant carries dimensions here. And uh, if it carries dimension, uh, so there are uncontrollable and provided divergences, the theory is not renormalized. And it's bad not only because you cannot calculate loops there, but also because you don't have uh, the real definition of the path integral, because uh, the only definition of path integral is a limit of finite dimensional integral. So you should uh, introduce a space, uh, lattice in the space and then uh, send uh, the lattice spacing to zero. And you cannot do that uh, for a non normalizable theory. One can, uh, well, cope with that, trying another action, uh, adding derivatives. So if you add for two derivatives in six dimension, then the coupling constants are dimensionless and the theory is renormalized. But so you are uh, led to a field theory with extra derivatives. And extra the uh, field theory with extra derivatives have a serious problem. They have ghosts there. And so that's uh, the reason of my interest to the theories with ghosts. And I will try to convince you that not always it's a catastrophe. Sometimes uh, the theory with gods are acceptable and uh, doesn't include, uh, involve contradictions. So what are Andre, both... Andre, Uwe has a question. Uwe, you want to ask your question? Yes. Yeah, Andre, I have the following uh, 
quite simple question. In yes. your little bit ahead, before, when you have this uh, um, F terms. F terms. It, what is F terms? Still a, bit, a little bit ahead, please. The first try. The first try, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, a question, why, when you have a six-dimensional <clears throat> space-time manifold, why are you not using a combination of uh, free forms, as it's usual in topological uh, quantum field theory, when you have free forms so that you have a, uh, can construct topological objects here? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, people can uh, consider such theories. So you should have field density, which is three form, and yeah. uh, then the potential is two form. Uh, uh, so uh, I, am not, I didn't follow uh, uh, well closely these attempts. But as far as I understand, well, uh, it doesn't work so much, so well. But you are right, and you, you can try also this. Oh, OK. It's just a choice. It's just your, your choice that you are trying several uh, options. OK, so uh, I cannot answer in full your question right now. But I looked at this theories with uh, where the potential is in two form. So, uh, as far as I understand, it's not really consistent uh, field theory. But I, uh, uh, it's only my recollection. I cannot uh, answer in detail. Oh, okay, thank you. And now, uh, uh, so we are led to ghosts, right? That's the motivation. Now, what is ghosts? Uh, the definition. Uh, which I prefer to some uh, other definitions. Ghost system is a system where uh, the Hamiltonian is not bounded from uh, below. So there is no ground state in the quantum spectrum of the Hamiltonian. That's my definition of the ghost system. Sometimes people uh, define it uh, other ways. They introduce not a uh, positive definite metric in the Hilbert space. And that's why they were called ghosts uh, right from the beginning. It's, uh, and then, in, indeed, it's possible to keep the spectrum of uh, the theory uh, well positive definite. But I prefer not to do that. It's more physical, from, uh, in my uh, viewpoint, to consider ghost system as a system uh, just with uh, ordinary positive definite uh, metric in Hilbert space, but without ground state. Now, uh, if you have a high derivative theory, then ghosts appear there or, or, uh, uh, all the time if it's not the genuine. Could I ask a question, um, Andre? Yes. Uh, you say bounded below, and you maybe you could define that a little bit more carefully because you said the existence of a ground state, and those two are not the same. Um, Maybe you can uh, clarify that for me. Well, uh, if uh, the ground state is the state with the lowest energy. Okay. If there is no state with the lowest energy. If there are states with the energy as uh, negative as you wish, as low as you wish, then uh, there is no ground state. For me, it's the same. Okay. So you mean the spectrum is bounded below, but not potentials bounded below. No, 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 the spectrum, spectrum, of course. Spectrum. Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, something which people probably know about the Stragratsky Hamiltonian. Mm, so, uh, uh, Stragratsky was a Russian mathematician who, however, well, uh, was a postdoc in France. And that's why he spoke well French, but didn't know English. Because at that time, uh, 19th century, English was not yet an international language. So uh, by what uh, well, achievements Stragratsky is known, well, there is a Stragratsky theorem from vector analysis, sometimes called Gauss Stragratsky theorem. There is also some method for calculating the integrals of, for the ratio of two polynomials. When I was a student, I knew that, but now I've forgotten. And also uh, the Stragratsky Hamiltonian, right? So what he did, uh, about, uh, well, it's 1850. Uh, as I said, he didn't speak English, and so he didn't read uh, the papers of Hamilton. And so he reinvented Hamiltonian formalism. 
and uh, he applied this formalism to ordinary systems and also the systems with high dilute. And so uh, he uh, built up the Hamiltonians for the systems with high dilute. Okay, now uh, some details about these Hamiltonians, if you like, or I can skip it. If you just ask me, I will skip it. So suppose you have a Lagrangian which depends on coordinate velocities and x, just one variable x, x, x dot, and x double dot. The Lagrange equations of motion are written here. It's one, just one equation of motion. Now, uh, uh, it doesn't depend on time, and so there is uh, conserved energy. Uh, the energy is written here, right? Now, how to construct Hamiltonian? You should treat velocity as independent variables, so you obtain the system with two couples of dynamic variables, x, canonical momentum of x, v, canonical momentum of v. And now the canonical Hamiltonian uh, has this form. So the idea is the, that the Hamilton equations of motions are uh, equivalent to the uh, Lagrange equations of motion. Uh, now you see here the linear term, and that's the reason of the trouble. Uh, it's linear in the momentum, and so it can be a positive uh, or negative. So the energy, classical energy, can be positive or negative. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of precursor of the Gauss because I formulated Gauss for quantum theory. Now there are two, two theorems. Uh, one theorem belongs to Woodard. Well, it's very simple observation, but still it's uh, in generality. It's his observation, though there was a paper by Pais and Tulenbeck well, in 1950 who observed the same thing but not for a very general system, but for some particular system, which is called by Solendek oscillator. And so uh, general theorem is that the system is not degenerate. Then uh, the classical energy is not uh, bounded neither from below nor from above. And that can be uh, generalized to quantum theory, uh, which was done by these people, uh, the spectrum of quantum Hamiltonian, for such a theory is also not bounded neither from below nor from above. Now, uh, uh, simplest example of such a theory, that's just a, a sum of two oscillators, but then uh, the second oscillator comes with negative sign. The spectrum uh, involves positive part and negative part, uh, all the states are benign, they're normalizable states. It's, uh, mathematicians say it's pure point spectrum. Uh, now, uh, if uh, the, the ratio omega one to omega two is rational, then uh, there is infinite degeneracy on each level. And if it's irrational, then you have uh, everywhere dense spectrum. So there are uh, states which are all norm normalizable, but uh, for any state, uh, it's, uh, in the, no matter how uh, close vicinity, there are some other states, right? So it's unusual, of course, but it's uh, not contradictory. You can write uh, for this system, the evolution operator, you can write wave functions, the both classical problem and quantum problem are well defined. The trouble, uh, uh, well, come, strikes back when you include interaction. So that's an example of uh, the Lagrangian with quartic term. Uh, ah, no, it's not yet the interaction, right? It's by certain back oscillator, right? So it's quartic, uh, quadratic oscillator uh, uh, with high dilute. Now, if uh, the frequencies are different, omega one is different from omega two, then uh, uh, there is some canonical transformation. So you write a Stragrasky Hamiltonian, you perform a certain uh, canonical transformation found this, by these people, 
and you go back to uh, this simple uh, simple Hamiltonian of two oscillators the second is negative sign so these two problems are equivalent both can I uh, 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 can I ask another question um, yes you have a, a, an oscillator uh, just above this if you just go back one page you have an oscillator with a negative sign in front of it a Hamiltonian Yes. For a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator with a negative sign, but that yes. can have an entirely positive spectrum. Well, so, you know, yes, yes, so, I know the. So, so, so one has to be very careful about what you mean by a sign in front of an oscillator. So, uh, I mean the first oscillator that you you have the plus p one squared plus omega one squared x one squared, that is a plus sign, but it can have a negative spectrum. And so, the states can still be normalizable. You mean uh, um, complex values of x, right? That's right. The point is that that when you go to a creation annihilation operator basis, you can you can establish that either there's a positive spectrum or a negative spectrum, and those states can be normalizable. So that's why I asked before what you mean by bounded below, because you cannot just look at a Hamiltonian and say the, eigen the eigenspectrum is bounded below, because there can be two different eigenspectrum, two, two different eigenspectrum, one bounded below and one bounded above. Uh, you are right, Carl, but uh, I mean all this real X, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't go to the complex plane. Okay. So I don't consider, I know that you consider that, but I don't consider uh, the complex values of X. And then uh, it's, uh, if you have this Hamiltonian, then the spectrum uh, is not bounded from the law if X is uh, real, right? Mm -hmm. You should define, your, uh, to define a spectral problem, you should define the operator, and you should define the domain of uh, the variables where they change. And so when you define the both, the spectral problem is well defined. And for this particular spectral problem, the spectrum is not bounded from the law. If you restrict your attention to the real axis, then you are defining where you are imposing the boundary conditions. Uh, if you define, okay, if, if you define if you say this Hamiltonian is equivalent to a differential equation eigenvalue problem, then you are saying, you, you need to say where you're going to impose your boundary conditions on um, the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, uh, so. Yes, so uh, wave functions, well, uh, if, if I said that it's uh, a discrete spectrum, then the wave functions, they uh, vanish at uh, infinity, real infinity for x1 and x2. That's yes, but they can also vanish at imaginary infinity, in which case the spectrum is negative. That's true. Uh, then, then it's a different spectral problem. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So one Hamiltonian can have many different spectra. Exactly. Uh, yes, of course, I agree. So, uh, but I'm saying that I'm considering spectral problem when X is real and the uh, wave functions vanish at infinity. At real well, infinity. Well, not really. Well, uh, okay. So in this case, they vanish at infinity. Uh, in some other cases, you can have continuous spectrum. In this case, there, there is no continuous spectrum. And so the way function just vanish in infinity as for an ordinary oscillator, right? Okay. Uh, for some other, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't like to discuss it today. If you have pi Sorenbeck oscillator with degenerate frequencies omega one equals to omega two, then there is no canonical transformation to this Hamiltonian uh, because it becomes singular. And, uh, but if you study uh, the spectrum of uh, and the dynamics of pi student oscillator with equal frequencies, then you have continuous spectrum. So the uh, boundary conditions correspond to continuous spectrum. But in all cases, X is real, right? I don't consider a uh, complex X. Okay. That's, that's the way how I define spectrum problem. Yeah, I know that your paper that if uh, X1 is real and uh, X2 is imaginary, then there is no problem. Then uh, the spectrum is positive, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's just different spectral problem. Yes, exactly. Okay. 
So can I continue, Carl? Sure. Please. Uh, Andre, uh, yes. still another question. Could you very briefly just uh, a little uh, intuitive uh, comment concerning this infinite degeneracy if this uh, omega one and omega two the ratio is rational? What's the reason for this infinite uh, degeneracy? But you just, just do, uh, there are positive, uh, the positive contribution and negative contribution. Yeah, sure. They can cancel. So, for example, omega one equals to the two omega two, right? Yeah. Then uh, you can have n plus one and m plus two, and it's the same energy. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I, I see. Yes, okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see. I I have a very elementary question. May I just? It's a quick one. What? what why do you consider these? Why not just consider a single unstable oscillator? Unstable would be an unstable. The, the one with the negative sign. What, why do you also include the- But it's just like, uh, well, uh, bookkeeping. Well, uh, if it's just one oscillator with negative sign, it's just how do you do, uh, how do you define the energy? Then the spectrum is not bounded from below, but bounded from above. So it's not interesting, I think. And in this case, for this spectral problem, uh, the states go all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's the real ghost problem, right? If you just can uh, get rid of um, uh, this uh, uh, problem of non-existence of ground state by changing the sign of Hamiltonian, that's trivial. Okay, so you're wanting a system that you can exchange energy between the pieces. Well, here for free, uh, uh, for free, uh, uh, well, Hamiltonian, there is no exchange, right? So they don't interact. Uh, the uh, trouble may appear when they start to interact. And then mm -hmm. I, uh, I will talk about it a little bit later, okay? But okay. if they don't interact, then there is no trouble. Okay, thank you. Okay. Including interactions, that's just uh, the uh, next thing which I wanted to say. So if you consider the Lagrangian of this quartic term, right, then it turns out uh, that uh, the ghosts will lead to a violation of unitarity in this system. Why? Uh, well, because uh, at, at the classical level, uh, there is some island of stability near zero, right? So in the initial conditions for X and its uh, derivatives are close to zero, then uh, there are oscillations and the system doesn't run away. But if uh, uh, the, the deviation is large enough, then, uh, well, first the, uh, it may oscillate. You see it's not harmonic oscillation, but some nonlinear oscillation. But then at some point, it, uh, you, have, you see a blow up. The system goes to uh, infinity at finite time. If the system goes to infinity at finite time, that's trouble in classical uh, system and also in quantum system. And quantum system that may lead, not uh, always leads, but may lead to violation of infinity. I will explain why, why it's there. So uh, to uh, do it, you uh, may consider a uh, very simple system, not high derivative system, which uh, is known, well, I don't know, since may, uh, 1950 or something. That's uh, the potential three-dimensional motion with the attractive potential, which is not one over R, but one over R squared. Then uh, the trajectories with negative energy, uh, they go by spirals, but they run into singularity, into zero at finite time. That's blow up. Uh, okay, if the energy is positive, then they go to infinity and it's not at uh, infinite time, that's acceptable, but uh, they can go to singularity at finite time. Now, what happens in quantum case? In quantum case, it depends. Uh, if the key, this coefficient is small enough, then uh, quantum fluctuations cope uh, with this tendency to, um, well, blow 
hard to go into singularity. And the Schrodinger problem is well defined. The spectrum uh, has a ground state, is not bounded, is bounded from below, right? And if kappa is larger than one eight, uh, then, uh, then uh, quantum fluctuations are there, but they're not able to cope uh, the singularity. And the Schrodinger problem is not well defined. You just cannot say what is its spectrum. And unitarity is also violated. What is unitarity? Unitarity is the probability of it, uh, sum of probability of all possible, uh, well, uh, processes is one. But there is a possibility that the system runs into singularity and just disappears, right? And then uh, the sum of probability is not, the probabilities is not conserved. You can uh, regularize your potential, for example, uh, assuming that it's one over R squared for large enough R, A, R, but uh, when uh, R is less than something, then the potential is constant. Okay, you can do that. You can solve showing your problem there. Uh, the spectrum is uh, uh, bounded. Uh, there is ground state, but the, it's, it's ground state and the whole spectrum just depends on A, right? You regularize it, but there is no limit when A goes to zero. So in this case, one can say that ghosts are there and they're malignant. It's not consistent problem. Um, no. Andre, can I make a, a comment about that? The, the yes. question of going to infinity and finite time and infinite time. Yes. Um, if you have a minus absolute X to the alpha potential, okay? Yes. If alpha is bigger than two, then the particles go to infinity and finite time. And yes. if it is less than two, they go to yes. infinity and infinite time. Yes. But if you have an up, if you have a staircase potential, which is just going infinitely down, that staircase potential, although it goes to minus infinity at both plus and minus infinity, that has bound states. And particles, Stay. it has Stay. bound. Uh -huh. What um, is staircase potential? I'm sorry. A staircase potential is a potential that has a maximum at the origin. It goes down a finite amount. It then is side goes sideways. It goes down another finite amount. It goes down just like a staircase. Okay, An okay. infinite staircase in both directions. This potential has bound states. Yes. Okay. That is because as the particle tries to go off to infinity, it reflects off the edges of this potential and the wave function comes back. It's reflected back and nothing actually gets out to infinity. If you have a continuous potential like minus X to the four, it also has bound states. And this is because although the particle is trying to go off to infinity and classically it does go to infinity and finite time, as it goes to infinity, waves are reflected back, okay? And it has bound states. If it takes infinitely long to get to infinity, this process doesn't work and it does not, it is not bounded below. But if it is a power greater than two, it has bound states, okay? And these can be measured, okay? You can actually do simulations and you can measure it. In fact, there are experiments underway right now to establish that you can really see these bound states. Okay, so although classically particles go off to infinity and finite time, you can still have a spectrum that is bounded below. And that is because classically the particle goes to infinity and finite time rather than leaking out slowly to infinity and getting there in infinite time, because in that case, there isn't enough back reflection, okay, interference where the particle uh, comes back to the origin. This is a very interesting distinction. So in well, fact, you, if you want to have a bound state spectrum, it is good if the particle goes off to infinity classically in finite time. That's a good thing because that means you can have bound states. Well, okay, Carl, so I just don't know that. Uh, I will be happy if you send me the reference, but uh, still in my, I thought that if the potential is just minus X to the four, if it's minus X to the four, and you 
stick to uh, the spectral program with real X, then, that's right. Then that's, there are no bound states. Uh, it depends on how you define the system and how you construct the system, okay? This has to do with reflectionlessness and so on, and I'm not gonna go into it, but this is work we are doing right now. And the key thing is exactly as you said correctly, the issue is whether or not classically the particle goes off to infinity and in infinite time or finite time. And the finite time leakage to infinity is what is necessary to have bound states and also reflectionlessness. But I can, I can talk about this with you afterward. Yes, please, uh, Carl. It's very interesting, but I just cannot answer that right now. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 so what I need is this observation later, because uh, what we are more interested in is uh, our quantum theories, right? Whether the spectrum is benign or not benign. And uh, uh, the statement is that if the classical problem is benign, then quantum problem is also benign. So uh, it's not uh, uh, necessarily uh, the other way around. But if classical problem is benign and doesn't have this blow up, then quantum problem is also benign. That's what I wanted to say. And uh, the, the whole uh, subsequent discussion will be based on that. OK, uh, so uh, the first ex uh, so. Uh, I, I uh, told that if you in, in, uh, include interaction for pi the oscillator, then uh, the ghosts are malignant. Even uh, if there is this island of stability, it doesn't help if the deviation from the origin is large. But there are inter non trivial interacting systems uh, uh, with ghosts uh, where the ghosts are benign, uh, that is, the ghosts are there but uh, the spectral problem is well defined. Uh, and the first example was uh, 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 constructed by Didier Robert and me, well, at that time, 15 years ago. Uh, and so I will remind you, I probably already talked about it and you again can stop me, but I will remind uh, what is this uh, system. So there's the Hamiltonian. Uh, it's not high view of Hamiltonian, but it's just Hamiltonian, which is not positive definite, you see. Uh, uh, now V is some polynomial. It's, if it's quadratic polynomial, then it's uh, just quadratic system uh, equivalent to uh, a couple of non-interacting uh, non oscillators, one is positive and another, and another is negative. And if a V uh, is uh, quartic polynomial, as uh, we'll consider, then it's non trivial interactive system. So you have four dimensional phase space, and you have here two integrals of motion, not one, but two. The first integral of motion is H, and there is also a second integral of motion. The origin of these two integrals of motion I will clarify later. That's uh, just one of these new results. But uh, you can just take it uh, as it is. And then you observe that uh, the Poisson bracket of uh, this n and h is zero. And if you have two degrees of freedom and two integrals of motion, the system is integrable. And that helps because uh, you can just exactly solve it in classical case and also in quantum case. Uh, so, uh, if you take uh, as this potential, uh, uh, well, uh, quadratic and quartic term, then the solutions, classical solutions, are just some elliptic functions. Now, for x, uh, uh, they're just elliptic cosines, so just oscillate, oscill oscillations uh, with some amplitude, but uh, the motion is fine. And now for another variable d, uh, you see also oscillations, but the amplitude grows linearly. It's also not a coincidence that it's linear. I will explain later why uh, this linear growth uh, appears. But linear growth doesn't mean uh, the blow up, right? It's benign. And that's why the quantum problem can also 
the soul. That's uh, the mention that there are another the nine ghost systems. Uh, well, uh, these people, and also very interesting paper, very recent interesting paper by uh, Jeff Aia, uh, Mokayama, and Wickman. Uh, uh, that's more complex. It's more complicated system than the one of uh, Robert and me, but it's also the system, a uh, system with uh, two degrees of freedom, and uh, which is integral. And so the ghosts are there, but they're benign. Now for uh, this problem, uh, uh, Robert, uh, the spectrum is the following. There are bands of continuum spectrum, starting from uh, omega to infinity, to, from two omega to infinity, on the right and on the left. Uh, there are positive energies and negative energies. And, uh, there is a gap in the spectrum, and uh, the zero, uh, you have uh, in, an in, uh, infinity of states. It's infinite degeneracy. But the way functions can be found explicitly, well, as integrals of some elementary function. OK. So that was uh, the first part, the introduction. And uh, now the new results, OK? Uh, so uh, we saw that the integrability helps. And so uh, if you have an integrable system, then even uh, if it has ghosts, well, the ghosts are uh, probably benign. Uh, so uh, one can consider as a simplest example, uh, the system which is called Toda chain, right? Here is the Hamiltonian. So it's quadratic in momentum, and there are some exponential uh, potentials. So it's three particles moving on the line, uh, which are coupled by some uh, potential, uh, which is not quite usual for those who haven't seen it before, but well, it's a very well known system by now. And the point is that uh, this system uh, with three particles has three integrals of motion. One is the Hamiltonian, another is uh, the sum of uh, the momenta, P1 plus P2 plus P3, that's uh, seen quite uh, directly from the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, but there is also cubic invariant, it's also an integral of motion, it's less trivial, it's like that, so it's cubic in momentum. And the idea is the following, uh, as it's also integral of motion, you can consider this I as a Hamiltonian, not H as a Hamiltonian, which is quadratic and positive definite, but I. And I is cubic, it's not positive definite. And uh, you can find the spectrum of I, well, quantize it and find the spectrum of I. And the spectrum of I will have uh, positive eigenvalues and negative eigenvalues. And so people have done it actually. The spectrum of I was studied by uh, some experts who were playing in the storage chain, right? And so it's an, uh, an example of benign ghost system. If you consider I as the Hamiltonian, then the spectrum has positive and negative energies indef indefinitely from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, still, uh, this uh, motion is finite and uh, the uh, wave functions uh, are benign, uh, they are normalized. Uh, so uh, uh, that's just an example of classical trajectories. Uh, so the classical trajectories, they belong to six dimensional torus in the phase space, right? There are three coordinates and three momentum. But uh, if you consider uh, H uh, quadratic as a Hamiltonian, then you have some uh, particular well tra trajectory. And there's the trajectory with, this, with the same initial conditions, exactly the same initial condition, but uh, we satisfy the Hamilton equations of motion where I is taken as a Hamiltonian. They're different, but it's also well uh, regular benign, there is no chaos because it's in an integrable system. So that's one example. 
so that was in my paper a year ago. Now, uh, some really new results not yet published, but uh, hopefully they will be published soon. Uh, so there are three classes, if you want, of uh, systems with benign growth. One class is uh, uh, systems which are obtained uh, by variation of some ordinary system, quadratic system, not quadratic, sorry, ordinary system without high DV. Uh, so, so suppose you take just ordinary Lagrange, and then uh, you trade x for x plus epsilon d, uh, epsilon small. And then you plug this x plus epsilon d here and keep only linear term in d. Don't keep uh, the zero term. Zero term is there, but you don't keep it. You keep only linear term in d. And then you obtain the system with uh, two degrees of freedom, x and d. And it looks exactly uh, as well the system which we found with a uh, very long time ago. That's the Lagrangian, it has two degrees of freedom. Uh, now, uh, uh, it's possible to understand now why, uh, uh, well, uh, why this D, uh, uh, the cl uh, classical trajectory for D as a function of time had a linear growth of the amplitude. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, system has two integrals of motion. Cre uh, the trajectory for X is just the same as the trajectory of the original system. And the tra uh, D is the variation of X, right? So you write uh, the solution for X as a function of T. You obtain some elliptic function in this F, I don't specify what kind of elliptic function. But the point is that uh, there is the amplitude, which depends on the second integral of motion. And, and there is also frequency, which also depends on the second integral of motion. It's not the same. It's not harmonic oscillator. And when you uh, consider variation of X, D is just the variation of X, then you uh, ha has to take variation of the amplitude and also variation of uh, this term, right? And uh, the variation of the omega gives you uh, just uh, the linear term. So it's uh, variation of omega over n times uh, time. And that's the origin of the linear growth of the amplitude. So that here we reproduced uh, already the known system, but it works in uh, many general cases. Just, you can generalize it. Take any benign uh, Lagrangian, which doesn't depend on high DV, of course. And uh, uh, plug instead of Q, uh, Q, small Q plus epsilon, large Q. And uh, uh, keep only the linear term and epsilon in the expansion. Then you obtain the Lagrangian, which depends on two sets of dynamic variables, small q, its derivative, large q, and its derivative. So uh, that's how this Lagrangian looks like. And uh, well, it's, uh, the uh, trajectories for small q's are the same as before. And the trajectories for large q are variation, variations of the trajectories for small q, and they may involve uh, linear growth in time. Linear growth in time, that doesn't mean blow up. So the system is benign. Uh, and, yes. May I have a, a, a question, please? Uh, what about chaotic systems? You're, 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 it looks as if you're studying deviation from a classical solution. So. Uh, change a little bit the initial conditions, and in a chaotic system, you will have uh, exponential growth. So what? Uh, about no, actually. So what I did before, I just didn't talk about it now. I took uh, this system. Robert and me, we did it also. Uh, it? We uh, distorted the system, so, uh, added some terms, so so that 
uh, it's not uh, exactly soluble anymore. Mm. Uh, but we distort it in some particular way. So it's not in my slides. I can uh, show you something else, some other text, but it's not in the slides of my talk today. Uh, if you do that, then you observe even better behavior. You observe some beats. So the amplitude grows and then it uh, goes down. So you observe even finite motion, not. Uh, linear growth of the amplitude, but some finite motion. But of course, uh, integrability is lost and it's only numerical solutions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, with numerical solutions, you never know. Uh, you can study uh, the behavior uh, well, for one hour, for mm -hmm. one year, but you are not sure what happens in a million of years. So there is no mathematical yeah. proof, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, but uh, simulations show that there are also chaotic uh, uh, benign systems with benign ghosts. That's the, what uh, we see in, in America. Okay. Uh, okay. So, that's the first class of uh, large class of uh, systems with benign ghosts, which are obtained by variation of uh, ordinary benign. Lagrangian and not involving high degrees. Uh, so uh, I uh, talked only about uh, mechanical systems with finite number of degrees of freedom. But you can also consider field theories like that. Take, for example, Young Mills theory, and uh, uh, instead of ordinary vector potential, uh, write A plus epsilon B and uh, do the same, uh, uh, play the same game, uh, uh, plug uh, this A here and expand it uh, in epsilon and keep only the linear term. And then you obtain some uh, system uh, uh, with ghosts, but which are benign with classical trajectories. Classical trajectories don't exhibit blow up. So I conclude that the systems are benign. So there's the first class. The second class are the systems which describe the motion over a Lorentzian manifold. Uh, so uh, if you have ordinary manifold like sphere, then there are geodesics and that's finite motion. Well, that depends on whether the manifold is compact or not, of course, right? But it's something uh, which is, um, well, at least uh, the energy is always positive there. If the uh, metric is uh, positive, definite Euclidean signature. But suppose you have a metric with Lorentzian signature. And the simplest example is the C to space in two dimensions. That's the metric written here. You see that there are positive contributions and negative contributions. The curvature is constant there. And now you can solve uh, the equations for geodesics. That's the equations. Now the dot here is uh, not uh, the derivative with respect to time, t. t is dynamical variable here. But it's uh, the derivative with respect to proper time, tau, right? So uh, x and t are just the coordinates on our manifold. And uh, uh, the dynamics is in some extra independent variable too. Uh, so that's the equations and they follow from the Hamiltonian. You see that uh, the Hamiltonian, which is just the metric convoluted with the momentum, right? Now that's uh, inverse metric. So here is uh, just ordinary metric and here is inverse metric, right? Uh, and it's not positive definite Hamiltonian, it's ghost ridden Hamiltonian. Uh, now, if you look at these classical solutions, there are two types of solutions. Uh, the solutions with positive value of H, positive energy, right? Which are just uh, finite and benign, no problem. And also there are solutions with negative energy. 
And the solutions with negative energy, they exhibit exponential uh, growth with this uh, independent uh, proper time tall, right? Uh, well, exponential growth, it's uh, not very Catholic, but it's not low up. So there is no, uh, uh, the system doesn't run away at finite time. And so uh, that gives uh, an example of uh, a benign cost system. Uh, so uh, for many Lorentz and many faults, the, the dynamics is also benign, but not for all of them. There are some Lorentz and many faults where ghosts are mal malignant, but for most of them, they're benign. There's the second example. Uh, the second class of examples, there were already many examples, but it's the second large class of benign ghost system. Now, uh, the third uh, example, probably, I cannot say about the class, uh, is a field theory. So, uh, long time ago, not long time ago, I don't know, eight, it's the paper of 2015, I uh, suggested a field theory uh, with, uh, with ghosts and with benign behavior. But this field theory was not integral. So I will not talk about it right now. So I will talk about something new about uh, KDV equation, KDV system. However, uh, observed with an unusual angle. I write, wrote that it's modified KDV, not the ordinary KDV, but the modified KDV. Uh, the ordinary KD, for ordinary KDV, things are worse. So it's, mm, there are also ghosts which are not uh, benign. But for uh, modified, they are benign. So consider this equation. The ordinary KDV, it's not U squared, but U, right? And here it's U squared times UX. You see here in this equation, high derivatives in X. Uh, well, uh, high derivative in X, uh, they uh, don't uh, bring out, uh, bring about the trouble because only high derivatives in time bring out the trouble. Okay, so uh, this uh, good system, there are solitons, exactly soluble, they evolve, no problem. They evolve in time, right? So there is some general solution for Cauchy problem post at some uh, initial time at t equals to zero, you uh, define uh, the initial data and then uh, it develops without any blow up, uh, everything is regular. But what one can do, one can just replace, uh, just rename time, uh, rename time the coordinate and x time. And then you will have high uh, third derivative, uh, the, Third derivatives in time. You obtain this system. And that's already the system with high time derivatives. And so it involves ghosts. You can write the Lagrangian of, well, uh, these equations of motion, they follow from the Lagrangian. And um, if you consider ordinary KDV, modified KDV system, then mm, this Lagrangian doesn't involve high derivative in time, but only high uh, derivative in x. And, but here, it involves high derivative, second derivative in time. So it's high derivative Lagrange. Now, uh, uh, we started the classical dynamics of this system, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, it's the same as study the classical dynamics of this original system, but to pose Cauchy problem, not at uh, uh, some uh, particular value of time, but at some particular value of x. So you pose at x equal to zero, the value of function, the value of derivative, the x derivative of this function, and the value of double derivative. So it is the Cauchy problem. You have to define at your initial, well, uh, moment in time here or, value of x here, you should uh, uh, pose some three uh, arbitrary functions. Okay, now uh, 
there are many several arguments that uh, the dynamics of this system is benign, so there is no blowout. I will give you one argument, which is the simplest one. Uh, consider the ansatz for this system. Consider the ansatz when uh, the function u doesn't depend on time. So it's constant in time, right? Then you obtain, then you obtain uh, uh, this equation. There is no time derivative because it's constant in time. And uh, uh, this uh, well, uh, uh, expression is equal to zero. But this expression is just total uh, x derivative of uh, this guy. So this guy is equal to constant. And you see there's a very simple problem describing the motion in quartic potential. And this quartic potential is positive. And so uh, the solution is there, uh, there's no blow up. And now you understand, uh, you will understand why uh, we took only, uh, uh, only uh, modified KDV. Because for ordinary KDV, here you would have u with, uh, instead of u squared, and here you would have u squared instead of u cubed. Here you would have u squared instead of u cubed. And that's cubic potential. And cubic potential is, of course, positive and negative. And there are trajectories which uh, go to infinity at finite time in cubic potential. OK, so it's one argument. Uh, also, I must say that if, uh, if you would uh, reverse the sign, it's also modified KDV, but uh, with the sign reversed. So there are two different equations and their properties are quite different. Uh, well, I never was playing with uh, exactly soluble system, but now I learned something. So this is called focusing case. And uh, this system with positive sign, with positive sign is called defocusing case. So the focusing case is related by so-called new transformation to the ordinary KDV. And so this defocusing case also, uh, well, has blowing up trajectories. But in this focusing case, new transformation is complex. And so, it, doesn't help us to do anything. Uh, you, you, it relates uh, uh, real solutions of the ordinary KDV to complex solutions of this modified KDV. And if uh, we are interested in real solutions of this modified KDV, so they're related to complex solutions of uh, the ordinary KDV. Anyway. Are we not, sorry, uh, Andre, are we yeah. not interested just in real energies? Why real solutions? Uh, we are interested only in real solutions. And that's why I'm saying that for this defocusing modified KDV, neural transformation doesn't help. No, that's I understand. But your objection was that the solutions become complex, but they still have real solutions. So isn't uh, real energy, sorry, isn't real energy is a more fundamental thing we would, should be looking for? And probably stability uh, yes, as well. Yes, of course, real energy, but well, the solution can be complex, but the energy can be still real, right? Yes. Uh, well, uh, what I said, uh, the only one thing, it's probably a distraction, is that uh, we are considering only one type of this uh, uh, modified KDV equation, and another type has the same properties as the ordinary. And the type uh, this defocusing uh, modified KDV, if we are interested only with real solutions, with real energies there, has different properties from the ordinary KDV. That's the only thing which I wanted to say. Okay. 
I understand, but why do you exclude complex solutions? Well, they, they could still have real energies. That's true. They can have real energies. Well, okay. well, it's a... uh, let's not uh, don't think about uh, this. Uh, uh, why I exclude uh, complex solutions of this uh, modified KDV equation? People, uh, all the people do that. They can see the only real solutions, so we do the same thing, right? Can I ask? Mm -hmm. It's the same. Uh, it's related to the question which Carl asked. Asked, right? If you have. Uh, uh, just mechanical system, and you restrict uh, your dynamical variable to be real. Not quite, not quite. I mean, in that case, you have to say what you mean by complex space and complex time. Yeah. Whereas in the KDV system, in the field theory, you can keep time and space real, whereas your fields become complex. Yes, exactly. And we but... are well accustomed to complex fields. So this is a different problem. Yeah. Well, uh, similar because if you have a mechanical system, then X is not space. There is no space. It's dynamical variable, right? If you study the, you, uh, maybe physically it's space, but formally uh, you just have a system with finite number of dynamical variables which depend on real time, and uh, yes. you should specify the range where these dynamical variables uh, can change. And if you specify it one way, you obtain one conclusion. And if you specify it another way, then you obtain another conclusion. So uh, if you uh, just require that uh, mm, uh, this dynamical variables are real uh, in, for mechanical system and also for this field theory system, then you just define your problem, right? I agree. It's just that it's different in a field theory than in quantum mechanics because I, I'm, I can have complex fields in field theory um, and there's absolutely no problem and they are defined for real time and real space. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's the, the case of an electron, for example. An yeah, electron. There are many, many examples in field theory like this. You don't have to insist yeah. on, on well, real yeah. fields. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if you have... Uh, for, uh, you, you have uh, complex fields, of course, a lot of them, uh, but then you have uh, a real part of this complex field and imaginary part, you can uh, one complex uh, few degrees of freedom, you have uh, two real degrees of freedom. But uh, for KDV, well, there is only one letter, U, right? The not real part and uh, well, I don't know. No, if you if you map it with the Mura transformation and you get a complex field, then you automatically have a real and imaginary part. That's true. Yes. You can then also look at this theory if you insist in real fields. You can look at it at the as a coupled system and split the real and imaginary part. But there's nothing wrong with such a system. It has real energies. Well, that's true, but that's uh, well, that's a different problem. I, I agree. Mm. Okay, okay. Uh, I just wanted to know if you have a have a more profound reason why you exclude complex fields, and I don't see that. Uh. People usually do that for the KDV, and I am kind of uh, mm. a newcomer to uh, no, this. It's, uh, just wanted to know. Thank this, you. This is also connected with. I mean, what you did before was to replace X with T and T with X, so that you have a third degree equation in time. Yes. Okay. Now, the question is, is this a well-posed problem as a, as a Cauchy problem? There, a a well-posed problem has three properties. It has to, it has to, the solutions have to exist and they have to be unique. Okay. Given a set, of, given the Cauchy initial data, but the key thing is that they also have to be stable. Yeah, and so. um, I'm not convinced of that at all. I mean, the, the question of stability is, is a subtle question. And this is what this is an, essentially what Andreas was talking about, because, because here the question is, it, are the solutions stable under small perturbations of the initial data? And, and um, the question is, 
you know, you 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 can investigate complex um, perturbations of the initial conditions, and you can study that. I, I don't know what happens if you do such a stability analysis, but it's it's not trivial. Uh, uh, okay, Carl, Carl, I agree with you. it's not trivial, and we don't have a proof that the problem is benign. I just okay. want to say right, right from the beginning. We only have arguments. Mm -hmm. And okay. I will show I will show you numerical uh, well, what Mathematica told us, right? Numerical solution. Uh, okay. So we took this modified KDV. Ah, uh, uh, well, uh, why this uh, focusing uh, focusing uh, KDV uh, uh, is not benign? Because you also would have quartic potential, but negative quartic potential. Here uh, you had uh, positive u, u to the fourth, and here you would have negative. Uh, u to the fourth, and that's why uh, it's blowing up. Now, the numerical solution. So what we did. Uh, uh, so uh, we started the evolution of uh, the ordinary K modified KDV in X direction, right? So X, uh, well, it's a little bit confusing what is X and what is time. So we took uh, this modified Mm, defocusing uh, KDV and uh, started its evolution in X direction. We paused, as I told you, at uh, initial uh, at X equal to zero, uh, the function, it's X derivative and double X derivative. And so we played with some initial conditions. So here, the initial condition, well, it should be periodic, uh, well, we can consider a band in time direction. So it's two pi is C628 here. Uh, so it's sine uh, originally. And we looked what happens uh, when we go along x axis. And so uh, we met a problem there. The problem is the following. So that's the value, uh, some number of x here is 2.9. And okay, so uh, you, the profile is something which is not bad and it's stable there. It's uh, uh, answering your question at this uh, range, it's stable uh, under the change of initial condition and its stability is related to the integrability of uh, KDV. Uh, well, if you have non-integrable system, then any trajectory, well, uh, is not stable. Uh, there's there just Lyapunov exponents, but if it's integrable system, then it's stable. Uh, now, uh, but if you plot uh, the x derivative, then you see some wiggles, right? You see some wiggles, and that's numerical noise. It's just uh, not real. Uh, uh, physical, uh, if you want, or mathematical uh, noise, it just is brought about by a computer. And that's why we cannot or could not, uh, I will uh, tell you uh, uh, soon why I, I said could not do. Well, uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, the way how I wanted to present this talk this morning. I would say that we cannot go beyond uh, some uh, horizon in X numerically. But uh, today I got a message from uh, Tibor Amur, my collaborator, and he said that he uh, uh, well, managed to cope with this problem. And I have to look in, into it. I don't have an opinion. He said that he changed a little bit mathematical problem, and so he, uh, he doesn't see uh, this numerical noise anymore. Anyway, I don't know that yet. Uh, uh, so for uh, what I know, I will show you this. And so we uh, probably cannot go to phi next. Uh, uh, but uh, in this range until x equals three, well, it's some number until the range where the solutions are uh, well reliable, we see the stability and we see nothing wrong. And uh, the last 
thing which I wanted to say that it was a field theory, but from this field theory, you can construct a lot of ordinary mechanical systems with a, a finite number of degrees of freedom. To this end, you just uh, have to, uh, one moment, just, just, I don't see the screen anymore. What's, one, what, what's wrong? Yeah, it's all white now. It's all white now. Mm. Ah, okay. Uh, so there are related mechanical systems. Uh, you can expand uh, uh, this U a, fun a function of two variables in a Fourier series in time. And then you obtain a finite number of modes. And so you can study it's, uh, the dynamics of this system with finite number of modes. And you obtain some mechanical uh, system with high derivatives in X, well, each place or all the time. And that's the simplest such system. You have two variables, psi and chi, right? And you, in the Lagrangian, you have uh, double derivatives. And so it's high derivative system. And then you can study the dynamics of this system. And here, uh, there is no problem with numerical noise. You can go uh, uh, in X until I don't know, 1,000, 10,000, and you don't see anything wrong. Uh, and uh, that's uh, an additional argument that uh, the classical behavior of the field uh, theory system is probably also benign. Uh, so that's more or less the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you for uh, attention. Thank you for the attention. And uh, there were questions. I'm very glad that uh, there was interest to my talk. There were questions during my talk. And now, well, of course, I would uh, be able, I would be glad to answer your further question if I if I'm able to. Thank you very much, Andre. Let's give Andre a hand. Mm -hmm. Any questions? More questions, I should say. Yeah, Joshua. I just clapped my hands. Uh, oh, you clapped your hand. It wasn't a question. Uh, it was really <laughs> good. <laughs> Joshua clapping hands. OK, OK, OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I have a question on the, the Toda chain. It seems to me, is it correct what you are saying? It seems to work for all integrable systems. Yes, yes, Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And then Good. when you perturb, this is just a, I, I don't know exactly the, the details, but there's an interesting um, formulation in the field theory for Toda theories. And that's the um, Lorentzian version of Toda theories. And that is not integrable. That's, that's, um, that's a perturbed model, but in a very controlled way because you have an underlying algebra. Yeah, so that's just a conjecture that, that these perturbed systems might be discrete versions of um, Lorentzian Toda field theories. Uh, well, what uh, I did, I perturbed uh, this I by, by adding uh, some extra terms such that the yes. is not integral anymore. And so I observed not regular uh, behavior, but uh, Numerically, I uh, observed that it's still benign. Mm. Uh, the way, particular way is not in my slides. I can, uh, well, uh, look now for uh, some, my, my, my paper and then That's I- That's probably published, right? Um, published, yes. This, yeah, yeah. this okay. paper is published, yes. Okay, I will have a look. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. More questions? No more questions. Well, we had a lot of questions during the talk. So yes, yes. Let's uh, thank Andre again. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you, Andreas, Francesca, and all the people who took the time to listen to. Thank you.